Greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. I am very excited for this week's uh, conversation. I would like you to meet Dr. Beatrice V. Orell. She is a leading astrophysicist at the Nordic Institute of Theoretical Physics, Stockholm University. She's not just an academic, she's a trailblazer in her field. She has a PhD in astronomy. She has a master's in physics from Uppsala University. I think she's got the credentials to back up what we're going to be talking about. Beatrice has been deeply involved in something known as the Vasco Project, which is all about studying vanishing and appearing sources during a century of astronomical observations. She's also fascinated by the structure and co-evolution of active galactic nuclei and their host galaxies. That sounds quite interesting to me. And she's always on the lookout for signs of extraterrestrial intelligence. She's the driving force behind something known as the Exoprobe Project. This is a new initiative. It's all about searching for extraterrestrial artifacts and probes close to Earth. In 2021, her work on the Vasco Project earned her the L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science National Prize in Sweden. She didn't stop there. In 2022, she became the first Swede to win the Laurel UNESCO for Women in Science International Rising Talents Award. It's a very prestigious recognition given to the top 15 early career uh, female scientists worldwide. Uh, in 2023, she took the stage. She did a TEDx Zurich to share her thoughts on why we should be looking for alien artifacts. She was also invited to speak at the inaugural meeting of the Saul Foundation at Stanford University. And uh, let's not forget the Heterodox Academy 2023 Courage Award she received. This award is given to those who consistently show courage in the pursuit of truth, championing you know, open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, constructive disagreement in academia, even when it comes at a cost. Beatrice is truly a force to be reckoned with in the world of astrophysics. And we have something very interesting to discuss in our conversation today. Beatrice, Dr. Via Roel, thank you so very much for being here with me on this program. Thank you for inviting me. I look very much forward to the conversation. Yes, indeed. Uh, perhaps we can start by just in, uh, discussing how you and I began our conversation. We've actually been talking throughout the week on a some very mutual uh, interests here. Uh, we were brought together by our friend, uh, German uh, journalist, uh, Robert Fleischer, who I have, I've known Robert for over 20 years, and you've known him for a while, I guess. And he had said to me, Richard, I want you to meet <laughs> Dr. Villarroel. And um, I didn't really know uh, what your research was about, but we quickly began discussing it. And, um, and then I realized why Robert wanted us to to chat. But would you um, just care to jump in and discuss the research that brought uh, you to my attention and now to the attention of this audience? So um, since 2016, I've been very interested in looking for vanishing stars. And I was hoping to find, let's say, a star that is there for, uh, has been there forever, and then one day it would vanish. We haven't found that yet, but we found some like, uh, very weird events like astronomical or what we think are astronomical events uh, where you see like multiple star-like objects that appear and vanish at the same time. We started all with that we found it uh, on an image from the 12th of April 1950 and we tried to figure out what, that, what it was. We started excluding like every single astronomical explanation we could imagine, oh, sorry, every single astrophysical explanation that we could imagine and then we started like excluding one after one of the different instrumental explanations. And we were still thinking maybe it's some kind of contamination from atomic bomb tests, although it's difficult to get that all of them would look like stars and have the same profiles like the real stars in the field. And the second alternative we thought of is that we're actually seeing some kind of artificial objects in orbit around the Earth just seven years before Sputnik 1. Mm -hmm. that is I like just to remind uh, listeners here, the first artificial or man-made satellite that um, achieved orbit of Earth was the Russian Soviet Sputnik satellite in October of 1957. And so therefore, it stands to reason if there were an artificial satellite prior to that, um, the question is who made it and why is it there? 
obviously. And also, like just to add a bit, uh, if these are reflections, like solar reflections of some satellites, these satellites have to be in like uh, tens of thousands of kilometers in altitude. So it couldn't be explained by V1 or V2 or these early experiments because mm. that you see this kind of star-like uh, objects. If you would have a satellite that is very close to the Earth, it would be leaving a streak. And uh, now if that is uh, solar reflections, but it could also be that there's something like emitting light. Um, anyway, so this is the thing that we found that made us wonder, like, if this is real, what could it be? And we have we kind of kept searching, like we did. A, um, we made a study that still hasn't been published because it was too touchy, I think, for most astronomical journals to hmm. deal with where we, where we were looking for a very uh, key signature of satellites where you find like several along a line, or where you simply look for like this kind of transients that appear and vanish within one hour, but also fall on a line. And we found two top candidates um, that are listed in that paper. Uh, in a table with along with three crappier candidates, like five in total, two good and three crappy. Mm -hmm. And it's there on the archive since 2022. And then uh, like the most interesting is that um, my colleague Enrique, he found some very beautiful example of three very bright stars that appear and vanish within one hour. Again, one of these very peculiar events. And it happens on an image from the 19th of July, 1952. Mm. And that kind of started a lot, a lot of excitement, of course, uh, in people, because not only the phenomenon we see is really weird, it also happens on a very peculiar date. Indeed it does. And I think a lot of people who have studied the UAP or UFO history might know uh, that date coincides with uh, one of the two weekends of the so-called Washington, D.C. flap. This is a significant overflight of unknown something over the capital of Washington, D.C. in the United States on the weekends of July 19th, 20th, 1952, and then the following week, July 26th, 27th, 1952. And you found an anomaly, just so happens, uh, on on uh, I think both of those dates, or is it one of yes. those dates? Both Actually, of those weekends. Just, uh, when we found this triple transient and someone else pointed out, hey, have you ever heard about the Washington flap? And I said, what is that? So yeah. it's my friend, Dave Altman, uh, he, he pointed it out to me. I went back to my old paper from 2022 and started looking. I had there these three crappy candidates and two good candidates. And there was something that looked like if it was on the 28th of July, 1952. However, it turned out that all the dates there are shifted by one day. So it's plus one day because of some like the conversion of dates didn't work out well. So it actually happened on the 27th of July, 1952, which is exactly on the second weekend. So that's the best candidate we have of those that are along a line. So I have two beautiful coincidences just by chance. Quite, quite interesting. <laughs> uh, and you had one uh, very good one, I believe you had uh, said to me previously from 1950. I'm hoping we can look at these images if you have those available. And and perhaps you can uh, tell us as well how you obtained these plates or these images. And, uh, and then we have a whole other discussion that we're going to need to get into relating to Harvard University and the management of astronomical data there under the... Uh, lead astronomer of Harvard at the time, Donald Menzel, also very well known in UFO circles. But let's let's look at these images first, if you can bring those so up. So start with showing the first thing that we found. Um, and here you can see, ignore the, uh, the purple circles because those are scanning defects we could show later. Okay. But the green things are, you see like nine stars, two here and two there. And it's in total nine stars that are there in one image uh, from 1950, and you never see it again. And uh, you can say, of course, maybe the second image is not as clear as the first, but we actually compared it also with uh, images six days later, one hour earlier, sorry, half an hour earlier. Mm. And they are never there before and never there after. So they look like they appear and vanish within one hour or 50 minutes. And what is the, the date of this image? The uh, 12th of April, 1950. Yeah. So that's how okay. it kind of it all started. And we were first wondering, like, is it some kind of plate defects related to this? Uh, let's say you have some contamination from nuclear bomb explosions. But first, why would all nine of them be so star-like? I mean, you would have maybe some different kind of shapes. 
plate defect usually have all kind of shapes, but and if, if it would be some kind of atomic bomb, uh, nuclear fallout uh, that appears on the plate, then it at least should be listed. There's a record um, of all, I, I think there's a record of match. nuclear detonations. And it doesn't match it. So no, no, I don't believe so. There's certainly not three simultaneously. Um, and do, are you able to, you probably can't determine like the altitude of these lights no, or anything like that. They're just images, right? Yeah, we only have one image. So, uh, so but there is a straight line almost. They look like they're almost in a complete, these ones in the center. Yes. Right? Yes, and that's how we also started thinking about that maybe some of them are falling on a straight line. And uh, that would be one way of testing if that could be some kind of uh, moving object in orbit. And let me show you what we found, actually. Yeah, well, I have a lot of questions. I want to ask, what are the conventional explanations that you and your team and your colleagues were able to come up with? But show, let's show, show us what you want. But I do want to return to that question. So we can start there, actually. The conventional explanation that we were thinking about was, again, maybe it's some type of plate defects with some extreme, that had some extreme, uh, extremely coincidentally star-like profiles. So for whatever, for whatever reason, all of nine of them would look precisely like stars rather than having different shapes. So that's mm -hmm. one of the possibilities. And the second is really this atomic bomb test we have been wondering about if it could be some unlisted atomic bomb test that left uh, some um, recipients. Forgive me for asking, but the uh, the three in a line that were there and then gone. So that's obvious why you circled those. But the other the other objects that were circled that did not disappear, why were they circled? Are they not known astronomical? Are they not known stars or what? Oh, uh, you mean the ones that were purple? Yeah. Because there were scanning defects. If you use two different scans, oh, I'm so sorry. scans and from two different groups, like I, I was using uh, Super Cosmos scans and DSS scans, okay. and you could see that this was something that appeared because whoever who was scanning them uh, used a dirty plate. You did explain this, and I just I didn't quite understand. So thank you. I appreciate that second time. So, um, so you said atomic bomb tests. No, that just seems not not to be the case um and then some other kind of optical defect or some other mistake we were glitch we were in the matrix. About, like plate defects but again why would they all have the star-like shapes or wouldn't there be a mix of different shapes i mean if you have some defect it's a random thing it's not going to all look have exact what we do uh, as astronomers is that we take uh with um we fit the shape of a real star and we compare it to whatever dot we see and we look at are the shapes the same or not for certain. Uh, are there any known astronomical causes? So, for example, we all know about supernova, but I don't really know how long a supernova is visible anyway. Yes. There's, uh, I mean, on these timescales we talk about, uh, there are some theoretical predictions of that you could have some, uh, let's say, um, optical afterglow of a, a gamma ray burst or something like that, but I don't think they actually found any yet. And now we're talking about nine of them. So for these nine and also over such a big uh, field, I think it's very difficult because even if you would have, let's say, a flaring star that maybe could appear and vanish within a few minutes, again, you need nine of them. And what's the probability of finding nine of them in such a small image? Very, very small. So we could actually be comparing to like an expected rates. And here is a far mm. too high rate uh, in comparison to any known astronomical phenomenon. So there is no known natural astronomical phenomenon that anyone can come up with to explain this anomaly. No, and even so solar system objects, if they, if they appear and vanish, in, if they would vanish out of an image in one hour, they would move so fast that they would actually leave a streak and they wouldn't leave mm -hmm. a pole source. So there's nothing like, yeah, no normal astronomical phenomenon that can explain these ones. Maybe there is some natural phenomenon that we simply don't know about yet. Yeah. It can also be that there's something we simply are unaware of. That May be I ask you, uh, what was the source of these images that you were studying? Where, where were they taken from? 
Uh, it's from the Palomar Sky Survey, and mm -hmm. that's uh, the Pal Palomar Observatory at Mount Palomar in California. Right. So it's the west side of the country. And they obviously have a very extensive uh, collection of the skies going probably back many, many, many Quite years. Quite extensive, but not as extensive as they have in the east side of U.S. Oh, we'll be getting to Harvard very soon, I believe. We want to talk about that. Can you show us, uh, so I guess the other images we want to see are those from 1952. Um, how do you want to do that? Which so I can show you first the one that um, uh, we, we found before and, and put on archive before I had ever heard about, this is one year earlier than I ever heard about Washington flap. Yeah. Uh, and that has a wrong date in the table because of this. Um, but this one is from the 27th of July. The probability to get such an alignment by chance is one in 10,000. And it and was an in perfect alignment again. It's And this is like uh, one in 10,000. And this is one of the candidates for something artificial that we posted in the archive paper that never was published. It was the best candidate, actually. And the date for this one is what? The 7th of July, 1952. <laughs> Yeah. I um, didn't know about it until one year later. So July 27, 1952. And so at the on the left one here, uh, we've got two objects at the top there. Very two interesting. And oh, yes, two at the bottom. It's actually it's quite symmetrical. Yeah, it's very weird. Uh, you've got one, a single anomalous object in the center and it looks pretty close to equidistant, doesn't it? It does. It's it, this is it looks like uh, I mean whether by design or coincidence it looks like a genuine pattern here. Two at the top, two at the bottom. The ones on the top are much brighter, but they are, in fact, they're almost um, mirror images of each other. And I, it, it makes me wonder: could this be some kind of? Um, well, I'm sure you've looked in. Is this an optical effect or not? I think they are far too star-like uh, because usually when you have some kind of optical, you know, like instrumental defect, you have a different again file. And you're too Undoubtedly. Bold. So, uh, and that's how also the next image I will show you. Yes. Um, yes. So this is July 27th. Okay. So so this is, I will show you now the, the most beautiful oh, example. Of... Before you show, um, what's the difference in duration between those two plates? I don't know if you it's mentioned It's 50 that. minutes of exposure again. How many? Uh, I'm sorry. 15 minutes of exposure in both cases. Oh, no, but I mean uh, the the di distance in um, time between the first and the second plate. So the second one was empty. Was this like... 20 week years week? later, but you can also compare it to images from half an hour earlier. And again, they weren't there. Gotcha, we, always gotcha. have an, we always have one blue image we can compare to. And Wonderful. check if it's there um, before or after. And you know that it vanishes and appears within one uh, half Thank an you. hour or one yeah. hour or so. Okay, so what else did you want to, uh, do we have to? So this one is the latest result, which is uh, a super beautiful example uh, that my colleagues Enrique Solano found. And here we have been wondering, like, you see, it's, it's, it's on the 19th of July, 1952. <laughs> uh, again, it never appears again. You, we also have another image, like, from, again, two months after, and you don't see it. We also have the blue image from half an hour earlier. You don't see it. It's simply, again, appears and vanishes with this within these 50 minutes. Yeah. And um, we were thinking maybe some kind of gravitational lensing because here they are happening very close to each other. So in other cases, they're spread over a big field, but here when they are very close to each other, maybe you could in some way explain it with a gravitational lensing. Although when we were trying to look at it, we were kind of, uh, it would need a black hole that is 10 times the mass of the uh, Milky Way black hole kind of, and then, yeah, there, there is some, we haven't really managed to explain it with gravitational lensing yet, but we have tried to think right. about, let's say you have some very short astronomical transient um, in the background that gets uh, lensed or lensed by this massive lens. So suddenly appears several images of the same thing and then they vanish. So we have been thinking about that as a conventional explanation, but I'm not sure if it works. And otherwise, it could, of course, also be related to the previous phenomena that we have seen before, that it's all the same type of thing. Just here, it's in a small image, uh, like spread in a small region, and there it is spread in larger. 
And that is from the 19th of July, 1952, also by coincidence on the fun dates. Yeah, so. and you and your, your colleague, uh, obviously, as you mentioned, you had no knowledge or even interest, I wouldn't think, in the, the old flying saucers UFO controversy. You're just looking at anomalies in uh, the history of uh, of modern astronomy, I suppose. And these are quite interesting. I don't know how to how one could explain such things naturally. And uh, apparently, though, you, the professionals, don't either. And that makes it very interesting. Now, yeah. did you try to publish these results or have these been published? Uh, and yes. when did you discover these uh, anomalies? So, and the first example I showed you with the nine transients was published in a scientific reports that belongs to Nature Journal. It was published in 2021. Uh, the second, where we specifically looked for satellites, has not been published. It doesn't even get to review as the editors are scared, nearly in all cases, except for one case where we had a referee. Uh, Which one? Um, I'm sorry. Uh, the second, the symmetrical one. Yeah, the first from 1950. That one is not published yet. It's because there we were very explicitly looking for satellites in pre-Sputnik data, which was not very popular for the astronomical journals. Um, and the third case here, uh, we didn't mention aliens at all. We just uh, published it as an anomaly paper. Uh, no mentions of any ET or so in monthly right. notices of Royal Astronomical Society. Well, this now, uh... I think probably led you into a little bit of a deeper dive. And um, so perhaps should we talk about that at this point? Sure, sure, yeah. we can talk yeah. about it. So there's um, two different uh, or two very popular plate collections. The one is in Palomar, but then there's a much larger one, which was the largest in the world once upon a time. And that's the Harvard uh, plate collection. They have a beautiful plate collection today. I think there are something like 500,000 plates left. And it dates back to 1882. So if you are interested, let's say, in looking at phenomena that could change over 100 years or 140 years, you could use this plate collection. It's such a beautiful experiment. And they started in the last like decades to digitize the images so that uh, this old plate collection can survive in some form or another. Now, that web page has a lot of ups and downs. I think it hasn't been working totally properly in the last years. But it's a very impressive plate collection. I would mm -hmm. say probably the coolest of the world. But there are some problems with this plate collection uh, that you have. Well, it was quite or, or interesting. Am I over, overstepping my boundaries here? Is there, there seems to be a problem with the Harvard plate collection that you uncovered. Well, I think uh, first this was known for the astronomers in the astronomer mm -hmm. community. And I think what is quite interesting about this is that it ties in to the other part of the story where we are looking at the plates. And that's, so in uh, 1952, uh, the, Harvard Astronomy uh, or the observatory got a new director in September or October. I, I don't know exactly when, but it was September, October, who came in and directly, like the first thing he did was to destroy one third of the plate collection. One third of the plate collection destroyed by the new incoming director of the Harvard Observatory. And that man was, do you give his name or shall I? I think you should do it. You, it's, well, <laughs> that man was is Dr. Donald Menzel, uh, of course, the famous Harvard astronomer of the 1950s and 60s who um, ran the observatory for, I think, 15 years, right? Um, and uh, he came in at that time. He was, of course, the world's premier UFO debunker for many, many years, for his lifetime, and essentially. The Washington flap also, and it was calling it temperature inversion. So it, it started looking like quite funny. So, and then so, Menzel, so Menzel comes in in September, October 1952, and this is something I had never known, but began destroying uh, a certain amount of this priceless collection of astronomical data. And, and also, um, and I know we're going to discuss this, uh, prevented the Harvard, I don't even know how this works, but he prevented so Harvard from collecting new astronomical data for a certain number of years. And this is known among your colleagues as the Menzel gap. Is that correct? 
Uh, yes, uh, the survey that uh, was there, like the old sky survey, was halted for 15 years. So that 15 people... years. Now, in advance of this conversation, I went to Donald Menzel's Wikipedia page. Wikipedia uh, really downplayed this a lot. I encourage people to go check it out. And they said he went in as a cost cutting measure for a couple of years, they didn't talk about the destruction of the plates. They only said he prevented for a very few years, the collection of new astronomical data. And that was known as the Menzel Gap. And, and when you read Wikipedia, it really makes it seem like we're talking just a couple of years in the 1950s. But in fact, it's much longer than that. It's a 15 year gap, 15 years. So there, that, there's yeah. an astronomer who wrote about it like in her autobiography. So uh, yeah, let's take a look at it. Finally, I got the scans. I haven't gotten the whole book yet, but the scans. And yeah. she became a persona non grata because she tried to defend the plate collection. And uh, so he, he was not very nice to her. As I, you can give her name, please. Uh, and Doris book. Hoflight. Doris, so I can Dr. Doris Hoflight. And... Uh, Apparently, he didn't even ask the astronomers what plates to destroy. He asked his secretary to go and destroy the plates. So um, here's the first page you can find from the book. Uh, so I'm going to read uh, like two small sections from the book. Dr. Chapley retired in 1952 and Donald Mansell became his successor. One of the first things Mansell did was to ask his secretary, whose previous job had been as personal manager for the Jordan Mars department store, to discard a third of the plates in the plate stacks in order to make room for more office space. When some astronomers took courage to object after many plates had been thrown out, he continued having plates removed from the stacks but stored in the cellar under the 15-inch telescope dome. He had long uh, plank shelves made and put so many plates on each shelf that the planks sagged in the middle in such a way that the upper shelves actually rested on top of the plates on the shelf below. Moreover, there was no concrete or other covering on the dirt floor. Although the foundation consisted of huge stone blocks, roots of the trees penetrated the walls and the humidity was high. Inevitably, the plates were doomed. The Harvard plate collection had been the largest in the world, probably the only one covering the sky from pole to pole with some series dating back to 1882. How could any astronomer, regardless of his own special speciality in research, wantonly destroy so high a percentage of plays that were vital to many research projects, especially for variable stars. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, uh, just fascinating. Now, when um, you tried to um, you tried to get information about this, I think on your own, and um, were you able to get any kind of satisfaction regarding the status of plates today from Harvard? Observatory. I I haven't been contacting them. Uh, okay. So this okay. Is something I I yet might want to do, but I'm what I'm curious about were like which third was destroyed. However, yes. he also destroyed some of the logbooks. So I don't even know if you the logbooks usually kept uh, which plates and like when the observations were being done, and I don't know if you can really fully restore uh, what has been damaged. So the logbooks would have what kind of information in those. Well, I guess like what plates, when the observation was done. Sure, so, yeah, that would make sense. Not all, but some of them, he, of the deceased uh, astronomers, it's written there. Now, I now, Dr. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm guessing, did she have a theory as to why Dr. Menzel wanted to destroy so much of the Harvard plate collection? Did she really, or was it just like this mystery, just like, why would he do this? I, I I gather that she just couldn't really figure it out. I, that's how I also understood it. And she tried to save some plates. It's described late in the chapter. She tried to save them and, and put them in her office. And he came to her and said, you have to immediately re uh, put, put them back in the stacks. And by the way, your project is also, uh, you cannot continue with your project. <laughs> so he directly punished her, it seems like. Oh, yes, yes. So he, she, she uh, questioned this. Uh, I think he had her office moved uh, next to like the men's room or something like this. Yeah, and then also ridiculous. There was some coincidence by that she got fired uh, from some. Uh, she she was writing some, uh, uh, some like um, 
some popular science stuff for Sky and Telescope. And then one day she gets, after 15 years or 20 years working there, she gets a phone call of that she's fired. And she yep. was, I think she was one probably wondering, even if she doesn't say it explicitly, uh, it happened when as her relationship with Mansell was deteriorating. So I think the, she was describing us uh, several of these events. Yeah, this is this is quite fascinating. And um, so you uh, continued to research this, and uh, at a certain point, I guess you were talking with uh, Robert Fleischer about this, and he uh, got you in touch with me. But is there anything in between that we're missing? I don't want to lose any part of the narrative here. Well, I think the interesting thing that I was very fascinated by was that when they had this big press conference in uh, 1952 on the 29th of July, yes, to d discuss the Washington flap, um, right? Since I had some coincidences in the time wise, which might just be coincidences uh, with the transients we see, mm -hmm. then apparently it was the same Donald Mansell who was debunking it and had said that this is some kind of weather phenomenon or right. Um, right, you you did not get things interesting. You didn't think that there was anything else other than the maybe the whim or quirk of a director of the observatory, not necessarily suspecting that there were any other ulterior or potential ulterior motives. And then you you saw this weird connection with the flying saucers of 1952, and that made you wonder. Uh, and that brought us in contact and uh, we had a conversation with uh with robert and tracy my wife and uh, the two of us and we we chatted for a while it was very enlightening and i said well i'm going to, i mean i of course we discussed menzel's ufo connection it's quite extensive but it prompted me to do my own new dive into donald menzel and you know i have a very large library I got a very large digital collection uh, and I was able to pull up a lot of information on Menzel that I had I had not quite realized just how deep it goes. So one of the things, and I, I'm going to try to be concise here, but uh, one thing that has been known to UFO researchers for many years uh, about Donald Menzel is thanks to the late researcher Stanton Friedman. I mean, he was a very important researcher. And back in 1988, a long time ago, Stanton published an article called The Secret Life of Donald Menzel. Um, and it became known after that that Donald Menzel wasn't simply a Harvard astronomer. He wasn't simply a UFO debunker. He had um, extensive uh, connection to the classified world. He really did have a double life. He had um, high clearances, met regularly with the leadership of the National Security Agency, the CIA, and other intelligence organizations, U.S. Air Force intelligence. Uh, he was a leading cryptographer as well. He was essentially an elite member of the United States intelligence community. Uh, he was not just a consultant. It, people have to understand. He, I mean, that's something many scientists during the Cold War did. They did consulting work. No, no, no. Menzel had a top secret ultra clearance with the CIA. He did classified work for 30 different companies. Um, in 1960, he famously now wrote a letter to President-elect John F. Kennedy mentioning his top secret clearance and quote, some association with the CIA, obviously trying to ingratiate himself with JFK. Um, in the 1970s, he was still around, and he wrote that he was a consultant with top secret ultra clearance to the National Security Agency. None of this was known until after his death. Um, so this is all discovered. Um, actually, this was discovered by Stanton Friedman in the Harvard archives because Menzel's name had been listed on the infamous MJ-12 documents. This is still debated and argued, dismissed by many to this day, but nonetheless, it was a lead. Uh, Menzel was listed as one of the leading MJ-12 members. People thought at first in the 80s, this is a joke, right? I mean, you've got the leading debunker in the world. He's on MJ-12 leading the UFO cover-up. It seemed like a bad joke, but it did lead Stanton Friedman to go to the Harvard archives and 
voila, he discovered it. But so all of that is known. But there are other things that I learned uh, by going through some UFO sources. One is that Menzel himself was a UFO witness. Now, first of all, what Menzel actually went to near Roswell in 1947 in July. He went to um, not exactly Roswell, but he went to White Sands, uh, New Mexico in early July 1947. It was a very weird kind of a trip. Not a whole lot has really been understood uh, as to why this happened. In 1949, two years later, he uh, witnessed, he was returning from White Sands. Uh, he was a passenger in a, in a car. Uh, <clears throat> and he looks out the window, rolls the window down, and he sees uh, two unusual stars, he says. He's very puzzled by it. He he said uh, they were quite bright, and he considered different possibilities, but he found their behavior unusual. He was puzzled. That was the word he used. And in fact, he reported this to Air Force Intelligence under the title um, Report of an Unusual Question Mark Natural Question Mark Phenomenon. So he was questioning whether it was natural. He said that there was really no, there didn't seem to be a, satisfactory explanation for what he had seen. That's Menzel in 1949. Uh, you don't hear a lot about Menzel publicly then in the UFO arena until 1952, uh, before he takes over at the Harvard Astron uh, Observatory. And just for the record, um, you know, you became aware of the July flap in 1952. But what many people to this day don't quite realize is that the entire year, of 1952 was covered in UFOs and flying saucers, particularly in the United States. It was a massive increase in sightings. Um, and during the spring of 1952, uh, during all of 1952, it must be said, Donald Menzel was clearly obsessed with these flying saucers. It is a year-long, a decade-long obsession, but it really seems to be kicked off in a major way in 1952 because what you what we learn is that he's meeting with top level air force officials in May of 1952 he met with the head of project blue book captain edward rupelt but also many generals many other high level air force people uh claiming that he has solved uh the flying saucer mystery uh the blue book people the air force people were not impressed at all by this, they're they're thinking, yeah, he's got some credentials, but he actually sounds like a, a college freshman, you know, doing his first paper here. The his explanations were were not impressive, and Menzel could tell, but but he was still working it very 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 hard uh, throughout the summer. And then he he at the same time he's getting Time magazine, uh, Look magazine, which was very big at, at back then, uh, to cover his. Uh, UFO theories. Um, he then has uh, gets a lot of publicity during the July sightings, as you pointed out. His idea of temperature inversions and all of this tricks of the uh, imagination, tricks of atmospheric phenomena. He says that's that's what explains these UFO reports. Uh, that leads, or that is part of John General John Alexander Sanford's press conference at that time, very famous. Many people, I think, have seen clips of that. And then a couple of months after that, he takes over at the Harvard Observatory and seemingly immediately begins the destruction of the astronomical plates. But there's one other thing here that has to be mentioned. And that is the discussion of these so-called mystery satellites. Now, this is not something that I think you were aware of, but this is something that uh, students of the UFO, uh, UAP history are familiar with. And uh, this was discussed in some books, uh, famously by Donald Kehoe, one of the early writers. This, in 1953, at the latest, we start hearing rumors circulating about large unidentified bodies being detected in low Earth orbit. We're talking 100 to maybe 500 or 600 miles around the Earth. 
were these rumors true? There was one claim that they came from an unnamed CIA informant. Is it true or not? I don't know. I don't know who does know. But according to this account, a highly sophisticated Air Force radar tracked these mysterious objects on 13 different occasions throughout 1953. And uh, they were sometimes called little moons. Um, as a result of this, there was a special radar tracking station established at White Sands Proving Grounds. This just happened to be where Menzel had been in 1949, where he saw his UFO. They establish a tracking station there. It is placed under the directorship of another famous astronomer, Dr. Clyde Tombaugh, who discovered the planet or Pluto. Is Pluto a planet or not? I We're all rooting for Pluto to be a planet, by the way. I just want you to know that. <laughs> But Clyde Tombaugh uh, is directing this program. This uh, was confirmed apparently in early 1954 um, by the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. I didn't really know much about them, but they are, existed. Uh, they confirmed that he was the director of this station uh, sponsored by the United States Army's Ordnance Research Department. This is military connected, military. And but what they said, and I just want to make this clear, and then we I want to come back to what hear what you have to say here. Um, the official purpose of the project supposedly was to check on the possibility of tiny natural satellites in orbit. And it is around this time that the Menzel gap begins. And not as Wikipedia says for a couple Wait, of so years. That's, again. <laughs> that's right. Um now here here's a question. Um We've got, in the context of this whole mystery satellite controversy, which is not rumor, but I seems to me to be confirmed to have been a real thing in 1953, probably 1952 at covert levels, I would have to think. Menzel seems to me was in a perfect position to know about this. How could he not? You would think, wouldn't you? In the context of this amazing mystery, it's like, is there a tiny natural satellite that we've never seen? Who wouldn't want to be the in, the discoverer of that? That's and yet that's when Menzel shuts it down. Isn't that odd? It's that very odd. crazy. So it's, that's that, that's the background, uh, some of the background that I came up with, and I just did my own dive earlier this week uh, into Menzel. Now, relating to this whole controversy of the artificial moon, um, I mean, it was said, and in, in when I was looking into this, that the moon, the mystery moonlit controversy was finally settled in uh, 1954. Supposedly, they confirmed that these were natural bodies located uh, 400 and 600 miles from the Earth. And this this supposedly eased the fears of the Americans that these were not Soviet or Russian art, artificial satellites. That supposedly, that was their fear. And they said, no, no, these little moons were not evidence of advanced foreign technology. They were just uh, natural. But even at the time, there was really no specific nature of these bodies that was given. Now, let me ask you, do you or any of your colleagues uh, recognize that there are such little mini moons anywhere? I've not? never heard of that. The only thing I can imagine is that this was another notion of near Earth asteroids. Uh, maybe, but I never heard of those little moons. Yeah. Say. I looked up in Wikipedia, so I tried to uh, look into this, and <laughs> I know it's Wikipedia, but still, forgive me, people, uh, just to get the official word here. Um, and when you look up the moon on Wikipedia, it is described as Earth's only natural satellite. And there's another entry in Wikipedia of claimed moons of Earth. And, you know, the bottom line is none of those have been confirmed. It seems very bizarre to me, which obviously I think it does to you. It does. And uh, very fun. Of course, I'm wondering if they saw something artificial. I can't help it. No, no, exactly. 
Exactly. That's the way my mind works, at least. Yeah. I mean, okay. if you think about it, like those times, it must have been so wonderful to actually do this kind of uh, like like if you would have a transient so like automated transient survey where you can mm -hmm. search for all these little uh, objects and events, astrophysical events. I mean, yeah. placing it in the early 1950 must be so perfect because you have no human satellites, no space debris. Like today, you have so many millions of pieces of space debris that is just blinking there as it goes in orbit around the Earth. And back then, you had nothing. And today, instead, we have a completely polluted sky. We have all these fantastic surveys, but we also have destroyed the sky at the same time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, so back to Menzel and the destruction of these plates, I guess, um, does it seem reasonable to you to uh, at least speculate that Menzel ceased all observation because he didn't want to investigate these yes. mystery satellites. For me, the combination of these uh, like three things together, the his, his position on the Washington flap that he soon after, two, three months after, destroys a part of the plate collection and that he sees us to like observing the sky, it looks pretty bad. Yeah, I really it's, want... It's something he, it's, yeah. looks like it's something he doesn't want people to see. He doesn't want astronomers to be aware of something. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe it's some kind of atomic bomb test that maybe leave traces, or maybe it's some kind of military experiments, but it's something he doesn't want uh, to be yeah. seen. I get the impression of that at right. least. And... Uh, and I, I also feel that Dorit Hofleit, when she writes the chapter, she's also wondering, but she never writes it. And uh, that's- oh, was You feel impression. that she was holding back yes. to get the sense. Well, this is my impression. This is all the speculation, of course. And this is all the speculation, but I mean, the facts are, he destroyed one third of the plate collection, if we should uh, believe Dorit, yeah. which I do. And mm -hmm. he stopped uh, the, the, the surveying of the sky. So these yes. are just little facts, these two things. Yes, and I realize I mispronounced uh, Dor Dorit Hofleit. That's my mistake. And uh, what is the name of her book? Uh, she has an unusual title. I, uh, I'm i going to link it below. Misfortunes as, as a Blessing uh, in Disguise, I think. In disguise is the title. And by the way, so what's the digitization project? This is maybe where we, we could uh, uh, wrap this up. Well, I don't know much about it, but I, I know that it's an extremely beautiful and extremely important project. And I don't know if how is their funding situation or so, but it seems to have been on and off. Is it working? Is it? Are they doing this? What is it called, by the sure. way? It's called Dash. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are like trying to digitize all the plates there and putting them online and available for the public. And uh, I think they were like some years ago when I was trying to get the images, it didn't very, quite work for a while. Hmm. for some years and now it seems to be on and off or I, i'm not sure it's, okay uh, all right yeah so i don't want to I, I, think, I think they are really it's a really beautiful project that i am wholeheartedly supporting um well um beatrice dr villaroel sorry i'm calling you beatrice in private uh but doctor um are you um are you engaged in anything right now are you uh are you following up on any of these uh this this Yes. project, these plates that you're working on, and is there a way that uh, people might be able to follow your work? So uh, one thing I'm doing right now is that I'm going to try to see, together with my colleague uh, Enrique, uh, whether um, we can find more transients in plates from the July 1952 in general, uh, versus, let's say, if you compare to plates in July 1950. Could it be so that we see more of these transient events and would mm -hmm. it be statistically significant excess or not? Because if we find, if we get yes, that would really help us to tie or like show or prove that there is a connection between our multiple transients and UFO observations. Indeed. Um, is there a place where people are able to follow your work? Is there a website or some other uh, means by which they can follow what you are doing? Yes, so we have uh, Vasco has a Facebook page, so uh, you can look at this our Facebook page called Vanishing and Appearing Sources During a Century of Observations, and there sometimes we put in small little news. May I put a link for that below in the in the um, description of this video? 
So we will be looking into that and we also have a new project where we are trying to look for the same kind of phenomena but on the sky as it looks today. However, we are have to develop entirely new ways of working with this since the sky is so polluted uh, with all right. these space debris and stuff like that. Right, right. So that's what I'm doing. I'm not giving up. I'm going to try to do my best to see if I can understand what we have found. I want to thank you, Dr. Beatrice Villaruel, a professor at the University of Stockholm, Sweden, uh, for taking the time to be here and to share your research uh, with us. I'm very grateful. I hope I wish you all the success, and I hope that we can remain in touch to um, so that I can personally keep track on all of the new research that you're up to, because I, I think it's fascinating. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so very much. I want to thank all the um, listeners here um, uh, who have been here for this premiere of this video. I really was excited about it and um, love to know what you all think. If you uh, provide comments below, I will look at those comments. I'm always grateful for your input on this and um, hopefully we'll see you all again really soon. So that's it for now. Thanks for being here. I'm Richard Dolan, and I'll catch you all in the near future. Let's keep fighting the good fight. Later. <laughs>